is the one that I had to flip over over here, and that's dissociation. Uh, how many people have heard this term, know what it is? Oh, wow, well, not too many. Okay, so let me just put it out there very quickly. Um, everybody engages in dissociation to some degree. I'm going to give you another highway example. You may think I'm preoccupied with driving on the highway. Um, you're driving on the Garden State. You got on exit 145, suddenly you're at exit 138 and you have no idea what happened to the last seven exits. That's normal dissociation. Okay, we call it highway hypnosis. All right? And hypnotic experiences are also dissociative experiences. But so that kind of thing is fairly common and I mean probably almost universal, no big thing. But people who've had a lot of traumatic experiences resort to dissociation every time they feel anxious. It's a way of kind of escaping from uh, noxious situations. And we often hear, for example, from childhood from people who, as children, were sexually abused over a period of time. They, you know, you might hear somebody say, well, when I heard his footsteps uh, coming down the hall, I would kind of go up to the ceiling and just take myself out of there. And I don't remember what happened. Or it was like I was watching it from up on the ceiling and I wasn't really there. That's the, those are dissociative experiences and they're fairly common in people. It, this is a common mechanism used by people who have chronic trauma histories. Okay. Um, and they, well, these kids often appear spacey, at times disconnected, not interested in talking about what would seem to be the real important things to talk about. There's a sense of detachment from what would, you would think would be significant things. Okay, we talked about behavioral control. Cognition is another area in which kid, kids who have this kind of history are impaired. They often have trouble planning ahead. They can't anticipate what would happen. They, and, and one of the ways to think about this also is to think about very young children. One of the things we know about very young children is that they're naturally curious. And as long as they feel safe in any environment, they will explore the environment. All right. But because these kids don't feel safe anywhere, they tend to inhibit their own exploration. They, their own curiosity goes down. And learning is actually built upon curiosity about the world. You learn best in school if you're interested. Okay? If there's something that strikes you as being something worth pursuing. If you have, if you, you're so constricted that you can't learn, you can't explore, you're not interested, it's going to inhibit academic functioning as well. Okay, and then clearly self-concept is impaired. Kids feel, uh, see that their own bodies in a peculiar way, they view themselves as not worthy. Now the, this list of domains of impairment that I just gave you, were described in an original um, uh, paper that was produced in 2003. And, it is on, and it's in your bibliography. Cook, uh, I think, is the first author. Let me just make sure. <coughs> yeah, Cook, Blaustein, Spinozola, and Vanderkoll. And that's the website, www.nctsn.ts. Net.org. I really highly recommend that website to you. That website is all about child trauma. It has tons of resources. It is absolutely, if you have any interest in child trauma of any kind, that's the place to go. So this, this article or paper was published on that website at that time and outlined this whole concept of complex trauma and these areas in which kids would be impaired. There's been a lot written in the last decade that's kind of, each article you read it kind of may describe the impairment somewhat differently, but the core themes are the same, and I think what I, what I gave you kind of still represents what people are saying about this. So in general, the impact of this kind of experience is that the world is perceived as dangerous, there's a belief system that develops that produces vigilance. You're constantly looking, like, like war veterans, you're constantly expecting something bad is going to happen. Uh, and it is a ready response to any cue that triggers it. So when you think about war, war veterans, what's the classic thing that they, they get alarmed about? What's the classic? Hmm? Loud noises, right?
right? They hear a car backfire and it's like there's gunshots, right? Well, these kids are experiencing the world as dangerous and lots of things that you might not think would be triggering are triggering. So, for example, if you used to get beaten up by a parent whose beating of you was preceded by some kind of frown or scowl, every time you see a frown or a scowl on somebody's face, your tension level is going to get aroused. If your sexual abuse was preceded by somebody stroking your hair and telling you how pretty you are, every time somebody tells you how pretty you are, that's not going to make you feel good. That's going to get you alarmed. So it's really important to understand that things that for the rest of the world may seem quite neutral or you know, not highly significant, for people with these kinds of trauma histories, lots of things are highly significant and highly scary. <coughs> And many of the behaviors you see in these kids, which look unadaptive, look like they, why would anybody behave this way? It doesn't work for you. Actually, are safety-seeking mechanisms. So let's think about some of the maladaptive behaviors that we see in adolescents in the child welfare system. Just throw one out. I'm looking up there for those people who work with these kids. What do you see in, in these kids that seems like this is a maladaptive behavior. Promiscuity. Promiscuity. Okay. How could that represent safety seeking? How could that behavior possibly be safety seeking? You engage in sexual actions for your own like physical <coughs> safety so that you're not beaten up. Right, and, and so that's a very good example, right? So that you actually see that if I kind of seem willing and interested, and that, that and in fact that has been described in the literature, that often what you see in, in people with these histories is safety is very much in the moment. You see, most of us think of promiscuity doesn't get you anywhere in the long term, but they're not thinking in the long term. They're thinking about safety in the moment. And in the moment, if you please somebody sexually, yeah, it might be safety. It might make you safer. They're just looking for some acceptance. I'm sorry. They're just looking for some sort of acceptance. Right. Right. Absolutely. What else? What's another piece of behavior that might be safety seeking behavior? Mm -hmm. Or what's a yeah? I mean, I don't know. I'm not in the field, but um, I would say if we're speaking of adolescent substance abuse. Well, situation. Substance, we tend to see substance abuse as self-medicating a lot of the other stuff that we saw. Right. So if you see heightened levels of arousal, and you te you know, and that doesn't feel good to anybody to feel that that tense, you take substances, it brings you down. So in that sense, it's kind of emotional safety seeking, but we're really talking about interpersonal safety seeking. Let me give you just a few more. Running away. Now that seems like like who. You know, why are you running onto the streets? How could you possibly see the streets as safe? Why might that be safety seeking? Because the tension in the household is more, is far more stressful. That's right. The da and the danger, the actual danger that the kid experienced. Now, the kid may not be in a situation now that you think is dangerous, but if the kid is being triggered by somebody scowling at them, and they anticipate that that's going to be followed by being beaten up, then they're going to take off because that outside feels safer than in this environment. You say it sort of all relates to a trust issue in a way? Well, yes. I mean, it, it does, absolutely. But it also has to that's the attachment piece of it. But it also has to do with the inability to manage that intense feeling when it starts coming up. Like, you, you have to act on it. You can't just manage it, think about it. The cognitive skills are not there to do it. So it's, it is, the trust piece is a piece of it. It's not the whole thing. Okay, so, and then a lot of other behaviors reflect more the need fulfillment that the kids didn't get. They didn't get attention. They didn't get loving. They didn't get, uh, you know, they weren't told that they were worthwhile. And many of these kids, as a result of that, have what we consider developmental deficits. And that's what I just went through. That is the kinds of things that most people who <coughs> grow up in a halfway normal environment learn to do to calm themselves, to get out of a situation, to plan ahead. These kids have not learned to do. Okay. 
So, 